let's welcome Captain Vester here onto the show. Thanks for checking in with us, Vester. If you're still hey, there. Hey, Guy, can you all hear me? Check, check. Check, check. So. Right on. So I see a question. I've been kind of following the chat here, and I see a question from Larry. He wants to ask me about my 918-50MA system. Um, in all honesty, for a long time, I used the 918 SMA crossovers, those two-line crossovers, to give me an indication when to buy and when to sell. And I also added a 50, and I used a different setting on that, and I added 120 moving average, and I used to use a 200, and I'll tell you, I went to 120 moving average because guess what? Another great futures trader said to me, hey, check out this 120 moving average because I saw this guy that, used to, that trades futures, and he's awesome. He uses a 120 moving average, so... So I went to the 120 moving average and not used the 200 ever since. But what I was saying in the room earlier today, in the futures room, I was saying that what I had on a five-minute chart when I like to watch when I'm in a trade is what I've seen time after time is when my 9 and 18 moving averages cross over my 50 and 120 moving averages, I can look for a five to seven point move. Now, today, I saw the cross and we didn't get it. And why didn't we get it? Well, it's pretty simple. It's contract rollover time right now, right? So that... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That. Yeah, I like that too. But, you know, so that's the problem right now is you got all kinds of pressure, people getting, a, you know, all these guys getting out of their contracts now and trying to roll over into June. And so they're trying to get their best price here and their best price in the June contract. So, hence the tight range today, because there's all kinds of this competition going on, trying to get the best price, and uh, of course people are trying to get the best price to sell, or, you know, to sell on, the, on either side. And by the so, way, let me just interrupt you for a second. I, I just want to let the viewers know that my platform has switched automatically over to the June contract, so you might be seeing this gap down, um, but don't panic. It's still reflecting. Is that uh, TOS that switched automatically today? Yeah, yeah, they they sent out a notice about it three days ago, and I can, um, I what well, here's what happens. And for you guys that use Thinkorswim, I'll let you know what's going on and why I use it this way. You can pull up a contract and just give the name of the of the contract, like ES. So in this case, it's forward slash ES. And then any studies I put on this chart, even though it changes from March to June to October, whatever the next contract is. Um, those studies will stay on the chart. What happened, I noticed a couple of years ago, is if I put a study on and I pulled up specifically, let's say the H3 contract, and I put studies on here, then when I was using the June contract, I lost the studies. I, I, I shouldn't say studies, drawings. I would lose the drawings. So I might have these long-term trend lines or, or whatever I was using, and they were just gone. And so I found if I just use the ES by itself, then those drawings would stay on the screen. Um, but of course, then you're also subject to them automatically rolling over the contract on you. Hmm. Well, that's. I'm just curious about that because I've used it for about four years, almost five years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I just leave it on my default slash ES for TOS, mm -hmm. it will eventually just switch over on its own, right? And it just did that today. Just now. Yeah. Well, uh, this morning I had to actually put in slash ES M3 to get the June contract up because I like to trade the contracts the same as the pits calling. And uh, when okay. Ben was saying he was calling June today, mm -hmm. I want I wanted to trade June. Yep. So I had to actually physically put in slash ES M3 because you're right. They do automatically roll over to the default slash ES. You can put in on TOS, but they didn't roll over to what? The end of today is what you're telling me? Yeah, so now they, if I they, put in uh, slash ES, I should get the June, right? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Well, you couldn't get that this morning. No, this no, because they said Friday's session would be the, the day they would roll it over. So that, of course, starts at 6 p.m. on Thursday evening. And I believe a Yes, fish... McMill, and all time frames that will work. I could do a screen share at some point in time. I can do some back testing on charts and show you how it works. Uh, obviously not around the chop today. Well, I've like got it. the 918. My RPM is Miris, and I used, I bought, I paid for the Ninja Pro software. So I paid for a lifetime license. I got the Ninja Pro. Nice. 
Um, so I have on the screen. Yeah, it the was 19. nice. They paid nine ninety five for it. I go to the trade show, right? Yeah. In New York, and uh, they have a deal on. You at the trade show, you can buy a lifetime license for seven seventy five. Wow. Well, I'm like, hey, can I get a discount? You know, I paid nine ninety five for it, man. Hey, come on. Right. <laughs> he said, no, sorry. How long yeah. ago did you do it? Uh what? About a year and a half ago, probably. Oh, <laughs> that's that's a ways away. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the last couple of months they might have done something, but. Yeah, I was with Lynn Waldock here in Canada first, and I had to have $5,600 for one ES contract for the margin. Right. And, uh, well, that's so, what it used anyway, to be I did last it, year. So I put, it used to be that. Yeah, so I put the money in, and I did it, and, uh, you know, I did okay and everything. You know, I was teaching futures trading at the time and everything, so I was doing pretty good. And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, I had a problem with their software. It wouldn't work. I think that was around, uh, I think we'll go back to around 2008. Go back that far, maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you know, the market was just tanking, and I couldn't even put a short on it because for some reason there was a disconnect between my platform and my money. Mm. wasn't there. So every time I tried to put a short in, it said, exceed your margin. And I go, what? So anyway, I got so pissed off with them, I closed my account with them. Right. And it was like the week after that, that's when, uh, you know, the shit hit the fan. Uh, with MF Global, and they owned Lynn Waldock. Oh, yeah. And it was so close to the wire that I got out, I was still getting emails from the lawyers saying that if you're looking to get your money back, oh, you need to click this link here and follow this and uh, right. this. And, uh, right. Mine, I, kind of just, I got my money out, thanks. So anyway, I went, uh, and then I took my money out of there, and I put it into Miris in Chicago there, and, you know, with them, I get $500 margin which is nothing when you put up you know one contract on yes you know what i mean you're putting up a lot of risk on that so you got to keep it in perspective i like to try to keep it around a thousand dollars to one contract is what i like to do when i'm doing it so if i want to trade two contracts i got to have a minimum two thousand dollars if i want to trade three i got three thousand i like to have like five thousand i'd say it's an even call you can do three thousand you do thirty-three, thirty-five hundred dollars to trade one to two ES contracts and something like that, and you can do well as long as you're winning, right? Right. But if you lose a couple, then you're getting squeezed. So, I would say that even that, you know, you got to be careful on these. Mirrors out of Chicago, I trust them. They've been around for a long time, and I don't really have an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I had a similar problem what you described there with uh, with Think or Swim. Well, really with TD Ameritrade, and the problem was that with the volatility that was going on a couple of years ago, the CME kept changing the margin rates for the contracts. So, whereas I had enough money in there to trade a couple of contracts one day, uh, the next morning I go to put on a trade, and like you're saying, the market's moving in a, in a certain direction, I'm trying to jump into the action, and it's not going through, and then I found out that the margin account changed overnight, and I was off by like a few hundred dollars to be able to make the trade, but nobody told me. And, you know, I, I said it out on the phone. I said, if they're going to change the, the thing overnight, somebody knows that. Why aren't you sending me an email saying, hey, just so you know, the, the, the rate changed. I could wire some money in and be ready to go by the time the day starts. But, you know, a bunch of clowns. Yeah, I know. They are goofs. You know, they're all out to make money. And, you know, these contract rollovers, brokers make all kinds of money. They just love all this retail guys getting in there. Just, you know, yep. buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. Yep. So I've got the 918-120 on the screen. I also have uh, the, the 200 happens to be on there, too. So okay. So I don't know if there's anything in particular. This is the five minute. If there's something you wanted to... Well, you can see right where the cross is on your chart. If I have this live going on where the 9 is your light blue and your red is the 18. Right. See right where it crossed over there in that candle? You can see if you entered a long right where that crossed right there, it's at whatever level it's at, and you took it up to wherever your previous high was, good line there, put it a little higher because they had a high wick up there, and see uh, their high wick there. So you could have got a bit more there, but you see that as long as this price action is above those lines there, that was your signal to enter it, and then, uh, then you can ride it up to what you would look for as a previous high for a gap fill. For like almost what you would call, I would call like a guaranteed fill. You know, if we're running like the wild wind and the cows are booing and you know everything's going good, 
<laughs> the crickets are singing a song, and we're going to go higher. Mm -hmm. Great. But if you want to try to just get yourself some money, you want 300 bucks or 200 bucks, you just take that little cross, take that move, and then get it out right at that previous high. So what do I do when I set up a trade? I do exactly that. I look for where was the previous high on this based to where we are now, mm -hmm. and I scroll back over, and so... Odd uh, time is well, every time what I do is I set my order in to buy because I get a signal to buy, so I put it in. Then I look and see where I want to get out. So then I find that level, so I set that order in. A lot of time it's off the DOM, the price range, so I'm first in. It's a first in, first out thing, right? Right. So if I get my order in there first, and then I look to wait for it to move a little bit and then see where I want to put my stop. Right. And I do put a stop in not as much as I used to, and that's. That's kind of weird for me because I used to always preach that you should always have a stop in when you're trading futures. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this: the um, it sounds like you're not using bracket orders. Is that, no, is that no, I'm using uh, OCO. Okay. Uh, well, the OCO would be a bracket order of a type. Well, uh, yeah, it is kind of a type. Yes, exactly. Um, but you you just said that you put in the order and then you set your target. So. Well, I pretty much have it already determined in my do you, head. Do you have a wide bracket that is being placed and you're just moving the, the stops around? Yeah. What I do, exactly, that's it. Okay. And you'll probably see me post that once in a while, so I'll explain that, how I work that, all right? So I get an order in, and I'm seeing the, the price action moving up nicely. Everything's tickety-boo. The stochastic is set up, and it's all going good. So then I pick a level, and I set a sell limit at it, okay? Okay. Well, Listen to me. So then now I put a stop in. So now I'm on a five-minute chart, and then what I want to watch is the candle move up. And my stochastic are set up. What I want to see is each candle should be equal to or higher to the previous one going up. Okay? So I always let it run two candles, and then I put it under that second candle, my stop. And then as it keeps moving up, I keep pushing my stop up. So the bracket gets smaller and smaller and smaller. When it's a perfect trade, I can get my stop above my entry by one point. Then I can almost just walk away and just let it ride. Because at the worst I'm going to be, I'm going to be stopped out with one point, right? Mm -hmm. Best I'm going to be is going to hit my target plus three. So, you know, there's at a point and today is not a day to do that. Let me tell you, today... No way that's going to work for you. The, and yesterday, even the, the chop, it's just, it's terrible. So there's got to be days that you pick and choose that you want to trade and days that you don't want to trade. And I'm almost going to put in my book now not to trade around contract rollover dates because mm -hmm. it was not a real sweet move today. I mean, look at the gap down in the price there at uh, 6 o'clock. Mm hmm. I mean, what kind of volatility do you think it's going to bring out out to see that huge gap down there on, you know, on open at 6 o'clock? If you're holding along there, you're screwed. So. Yeah, I'm not even sure how that works if you held a March long. Um, well, I guess the March still trades for another week or two, right? Yeah, we're good till next Friday. Okay. Next Friday, you got to be all out, done. So. I had that question posted to me earlier today in a PM by a member. I won't disclose who. So they were short at a certain level and then, and asked me about how that works. And I said, well, you know, if the uh, June contract is trading higher, and it's not right now, but, I mean, if it happens to move higher than where you are now, you could be screwed because on the rollover, you'll automatically be at that price when you move into it. They'll move you automatically. On a short. Yeah, so if you're on a short and you're at, you know, 40, and let's say June's at 50... You're in there now, it's short at 40, and it's at 50. Hmm. That's kind of an extreme example, but that's what can happen to you if you try to hold a contract on the rollover. You can either benefit by getting a good gap down, and then you can get out. So if we're at 40 right now in the March, and the, thir and the uh, June's at 35, you can hold that and get 5 right on the rollover if you want to get out. But if it happens to go the other way, then, you know... Good luck to you. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> Let me just back up what you're saying. 
if you're on a rollover day, you're talking about like today rollover day, or you're talking no, about I'm talking about next day. Friday. Next Friday, next Friday, you will automatically be moved over to the new contract. Okay, so why would it roll to the June? Why wouldn't you just be exercising delivery of those future contracts? Because you're still in it, and as far as the uh, futures contracts go, it's still going. So no, I mean, at, uh, you said on I don't know what day. You're, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, on rollover, well, rollover day, March ends. Yeah, so, so they'll just I'll have to take, take whatever you're holding and move you into the June contract because you haven't sold it. You all right? But what I'm getting at is, why wouldn't you get exercise on those contracts? Why would you actually be able to roll it to June? Because you can. They don't exercise your option. You know what I'm saying? That's just, that's the. You premise. can hold it. You can hold it for a year, and it'll roll you over automatically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about like you know oil. I could be long futures, and you get no, no. delivery of cattle, but yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't think that works either. I mean, I had a friend who uh, did that with rice, and he should have had like a ton on his front lawn. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, RPM's having a heart attack over there. I'm not exactly sure why, but. Um, he's, I guess, thinking back to the days when when he was rolling in his own futures there. Um, so here, I just want to demonstrate for some of those who may not be familiar with looking at the, the DOM for futures, and this is one of them. Uh, there's definitely all kinds of ways you can configure this. And what I've done is I've set up an auto bracket. I've set up a uh, profit and a stop here automatically the checkbox is checked for auto and so if I place a trade here so let's say I decide to go long at uh, 2 well let me just do it at 250 Don't! so it executes I do a short you do a short there well, <laughs> yeah I do short yeah I'm just uh, it's a simulator I'm looking so. at mine and yeah it looks like a short now when I did that it automatically threw a, a profit target up here at 20 ticks and it threw a stop order down here at 20 ticks and these are what you heard Vester refer to as OCOs. Uh, one order cancels the other. So in other words, if my target gets hit, it cancels the stop. If the stop gets hit, it cancels the target. And um, it sounds like from what you described that you, you got your entry, and then, and that's to save some time, and then it's 20 ticks away, so it's kind of hard for it to do that in a heartbeat. Um, but now you can go and say, all right, let's move this target you know, in this case, you said you're short, so you don't expect it to move anywhere. So let's say you moved it to two ticks, and then you took your stop and said, uh, well, if we drop below, you go back to the chart. I don't know if you'd say the low of, uh, of the prior session, which is this red line on my screen. It looks like 37. No. 30. Yeah, 37 is the low of uh, not the prior session, but the session before. Hmm. If well, I'm not confusing anybody. Any you guys want to hear about risk management and how I do it? And as far as stops, what I look at? That sounds awesome. You keep the DOM up there because that's going to be key on this. Oh, right? you know what? I just realized this DOM is bringing up the H3. That's why it didn't look right. All right. Let me get there's, the uh, June 3 while you're talking. Go ahead. Okay, there's a couple of different things I use for my risk management. And a lot of times, like I said, I don't put a stop in when I put my order in because... Like RPM has pretty much made sense of it before. They sniff you out, right? So if you get it in too close and you're finally getting stopped out all the time, guess what? Because you put it so close and it's on a DOM. If you're two to three, four ticks away from where the price action is, I can easily come down there and whip you out. It can be five or six and take you out. So how do I address that now? I want to tell you exactly what I do. And I'll tell you, for full disclosure, sometimes this can cost me a few more ticks than I would really like to take if I'm wrong on a trade. But I'll tell you, it keeps me in more trades, and I get my desired result by giving it the room, but keeping protection in there. So there's two different ways I do this. One is if I set up an order and I'm along in a position, and you see it on the DOM that he has right there. I will take and set a stop. You see the last price, 149 contracts at 1534.75. I'll put a stop just below that, so I'm outside of the price range on the DOM. Now, if I'm right on my trade, it should never go further down that way, and it should be moving up the prices on the DOM. So it should be good. 
and then I can just keep sliding that up and just keep it out. Now the second way I do it is, I've already started to describe it, is if I enter a trade on a one minute shot, sorry I was just reading uh, in my house your shoot, <laughs> uh, if I enter it on a one minute and it looks like I'm at the low and I'm good, I'll go back and I watch it on a five minute chart and I want to see two candles, three candles form on a five minute chart, say I'm long, and I'm at the same time watching a 15 minute and a 30 minute on my other computers. So it should be going up. So I see it's going up. I see a reverse. I see other things I no. use, like moving averages. I use stochastic slow. Trend lines. Trend lines are big, especially on days like today when the moving averages pretty much don't do nothing for you, or the stochastic really don't do a lot for you. The thing you can rely on at the bottom is the price action move and uh, the trend lines that you draw. So that's another key thing is if I see the price action moving, I got a trend line under the bottom of the price action and it seems to be bouncing off it. It's in a good channel. Uh, and as long as you're on that channel, we're good. So my stop, a lot of times if I'm long too, I'll sell four and I'll keep pushing it up on the bottom side of that underside of that channel. So whenever it breaks that channel, I'm locked in my profits and I'm short too right then because it's a key level that when you start moving up on a channel and you break it, and you break that channel, you're probably going to get a pull down, a breakdown of that. So I got too short running all the way. It's another strategy I use. Okay. Are these guys asking direct questions here, or are we just having a good time? Everyone saying hi to one another in the chat room. You're listening to Vester here on DayTradingRadio.com. We're going over some of his futures methods, and what you're describing is a lot to do with reading candlesticks, reading levels, reading prior levels, prior areas of resistance and support. Sound about right? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a trader here uh, on an interview, Kumar, had called in. We talked a lot about uh, VPOC and volume profiles. Uh, do you find that you you make use of anything like that? Uh, well, right now, I'd love to provide a screenshot for you because I use the Ninja Pro. So I've got uh, buy sell volume profile indicator at the bottom, but then I also have volume coming in on the left side, and it shows me all the buy and sell volume. Um, and I can't do a screenshot. Well, I can do it, but it's not even on the chat where I have the chat. It's on a different computer. Oh, okay. So I'd have to open up the chat. I'll have to log in as Bylot. So what I'll do is I'll uh, open up the DTRS. I'll, I'll, I'll do a screenshot of what I have right now, and I'll be a Bylot in there, and I'll paste this. I'll do a screen share on it and show you. Okay. Let me open up a separate chat room on my other computer, and that way I can copy. Well, it. it'll be in the main chat there. Yeah, I'm not. That's a different machine for me. All right. So I got to log in separately here. I got to open up you guys. All right. I'll show you exactly what I look at every day. All right, so once you're able to paste it in there, I can bring that up on the screen for everyone. And that right. short you called is actually working out, already up on two ticks. And I see a trend line sneaking in a view here. Yeah, I also see a 50 moving average, 120 curled right there at the pivot as well. So I'd be curious to see what happens at that level. I don't really think it's going to drop I think below I that. Changes to M3 so that we can get a clearer reflection of those. 1535.63. So 63 doesn't make sense. So Vester's already news. I know. So I'm going to be by lot. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. J-Dub so, loves that one too. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to minimize this. Maximize that, and uh, all right now. Where's my screen share? This minute, got issues here. So we broke through the 200 period average here on the five minute chart. I don't have a screen share on my laptop. I think I do. This hmm. is not the machine with Skype on it, right? Well, all three have Skype on it. Yeah, I'm on the my other machine. I don't have Ninja on that Skype though. I want to show you the Ninja. Uh huh. Just a minute. Do, do, yeah, it's do, there. Do, yeah, do, it's do. there. Hold on. Macy's and J.C. Penney were ordered into mediation today. 
their uh, ridiculous lawsuit. Somebody's trying to get a hold of me. All right, I can't maximize my screen here. I'm trying to get this stupid thing working. I'll do it, and uh, I'll be in there. I'll be posting this as bylot, and you'll see what I'm talking about as far as my volume profile was directs to your question. Do I use it? Not the same as FT, and not the same as well, I don't know. Andy doesn't probably use it. So, do I use volume though? Hell yes. Is volume important? Hell yes. Do I like a volume profile? Kind of don't like to look at, that's where price is going to go based on that we had volume there before. I like to actually see where price is actually when it's moving. What I like to see more is what I have on my Ninja, which tells me that the volume coming in on this candle on a five minute, do I see more red or more green? So I see the green and the red volume. So if I see more green volume than the red on that, then I know that we're probably going to keep moving up. I see a huge shooting they're all red coming in there, but I know that they're selling hard into this, and uh, anybody that's trying to buy into this, there's, the pros are selling it off and taking a short on it. So, I said to uh, Bry Guy, this would be a short, not a long, that you put it in right now. And so, I'm going to try and copy this and put it in as a buy lot in the chat room. Okay. And I think I'm in the main room now, so let's see if it comes in there. So this should be a screencast. There you go. All right. So now you can click on that and you do a full screen on it. All right, might take a second to show up on the broadcast, but it is there. Okay, so we're looking at see the volume coming in on the right or sorry, left hand side there. You can see how the greens kind of minimize there, and you see how the red volume extends out over. Mm -hmm. This is also set up as the uh, three and eight moving average. You can see they cross right there. There's like a tight point right at the top there, and that gap down when it opened back up at six o'clock. Wasn't expecting that, but I mean, if you're holding a short there, you're going woo hoo. But anyway, uh, even then, still, see how we're holding it. See how price action is not coming across and over my line there? And it's been moving down. And you can see yeah, all the volume when it's moving in here from the left-hand side. Very little buying and a lot of selling. And uh, that range doesn't really come down to where we are in price right now, right? So we're in nighttime now, so we got very little, very little volume. Look, there's little tickies on the left there, very little. Along the bottom, I got buy sell volume on ES. This is set up on the June contract right now. And then I run a double stochastic, and then I run a slow stochastic. And so I look at the stochastic as well as the uh, the double, and the double gives me kind of a clue before we get sold off completely on the you know the double, or sorry, the uh, regular stochastic. But anyway, so the moving average lines keep me uh, in the short if I'm short. The biggest thing I guess I want to say is that, you know, yes, I try to focus on the candles. And if you're looking at them right there, that's a three-minute chart. And it's pretty simple that you watch that each candle goes down and doesn't open higher than the previous one and it keeps moving down. So you hold the trend and you hold the short. And it's under the moving average line. So I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the volume there, but I'll tell you, I do glance at the whole chart and I can see that easily. And I'm not trying to look at other indicators waiting for the price action to feed that indicator to tell me what it's doing. I try to focus on price first and then just view the whole thing and see the price as it's going. And that works for me. I mean, maybe not something for everybody else, but it works for me and it works well. Mm -hmm. So as this is coming down, I'm imagining you're looking back over to the left. You see in 37 here as a level possible. Yeah, yeah. is that the level right there? Yeah, that would be say, okay, yeah, if we're here now, we have no period of resistance up to this point, and then, yeah, we're going to gap that right there. Right. Then I would say if we look at this, maybe we'll get a nice double bottom bounce, and then maybe we'll take a nice bounce off that. Mm -hmm. So you'd stay in that trade because the candles just continue to print lower and lower. Yeah. Down now, there. this one right now, I don't know what it's doing right now because I don't have it. Let me see. I've got to close this. What's it doing? Yeah. So it's still, it's, no, sorry. Yeah. 
So on the actual trading platform, yeah, my I'll stochastic, my up. double stochastic is starting to move up now, but price is not moving up. Mm -hmm. So that's what I call divergence. When you see me talk about divergence in the room, mm -hmm. if you're in the futures room, I typically talk about it on a five-minute chart because seeing it on a one-minute chart doesn't mean squat. Right. But on a, a five-minute chart, it means a lot more. So if you see... Mm -hmm. The stochastic selling off, rolling down on a five-minute chart, but you see price holding, and I know Johnny's talked about this all the time. You see some good divergence. So what you're expecting is if price holds at uh, 37 even here right now, in our five minutes rolling over, we're seeing divergence there. That Our expectation is that when that five-minute stock crosses and rolls around back up to the long, that we're going to go from 37 to the moon. No, we're not going to go to the moon, but say we'll go from 37 to 39. We're actually going to start to move up. And uh, that's another thing I pay attention to on a five-minute. Mm -hmm. So here's a whole bunch of contracts just came through at 38.75. So that 39 didn't hold, at least for now. Yeah, probably not, because if I'm watching the five, well, I'm, on, I'm on a three-minute right now. I think what I posted, I think what I showed you was a three-minute. I should have had it on a five but even on a three-minute, it's working pretty good. Usually, I, w I like to watch a two-minute when I'm trading, especially lately when it's been so choppy. Mm -hmm. If you put it on a five-minute, I mean, it's like too long. You're going to get yourself burned. Mm. So two-minute, if I want to get in and out quicker on scalps mm -hmm. lately, yeah, I switched that. The three and eight, I switched to about, I'll say, a month ago. Um, the 918... Uh, I still like to watch the 918 on longer term charts on the TOS. I got two other computers. I run a 15 minute and a 30 minute chart, and I can take one of the computers and switch it to a 60 whatever I want or do whatever. Uh, laptop runs exclusively my uh, Ninja. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that's on that. So DTR Chat is on one of the other two computers. Um, and the audio. Uh, and like I say, the other computer is exclusively set up for, you know, looking at the 5, 15, 30, or whatever, 60-minute charts. But I'm going to uh, add one more monitor onto my one computer. I'm just locking one. So I'm going to take one, I'm going to mount it on the wall of my office here, and then put one more on the desk, and then uh, have one more look. Mm -hmm. Do you have your ordering system on its own machine? Professor, I think you cut out on me. I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. Um, I just my ordering system. I got the, the Ninja Pro. That that's where you place your orders. Yeah, I can place them on the chart. If I do Chart Trader, or I can do it on the DOM. Okay. And I've had that installed on two computers, not on my third computer. I just have it on two, but I can yeah. only have it open on one at a time. Yeah. But, yeah. Is that that was something that I found uh, when I went to the expo. Uh, and of course, I know you were there too. But one of the presenters was uh, Linda Rashke, and that was something that she said in her presentation. And she didn't draw attention to it, but it was just something she said in passing. Was the fact that she had all her charts in front of her, and when she is ready to place the trade, she has to turn her body to the laptop off to the side, and that's where she's placing her order. So it kind of creates this deliberate task when you go to place the order. Yeah, well, that's funny. My laptop's right in the middle between my other two computers. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trading is right in front of my eyes. Okay. If I want to look at anything else, then I look left or right. But what I'm trading is right there, right in front of me. And that's what I want to try to tell you guys is the same thing when you're looking at charts. Trade what you see. Trade what you see right in front of you. Yeah. So I don't know how I can emphasize that anymore, but especially and, uh, if you're futures, not stocks so much, but futures. Yeah. yeah. And you guys out there, if you're just tuning in, um, I want you to note that we're looking at the June contract here on the screen. I know Johnny had the March all day long, but the TOS platform switched over to June, and uh, very likely tomorrow he'll be having June on the screen. And I heard him asking about that earlier today. I don't know why it was decided to keep March. It sounded like everybody was talking about June. Well, I'm not sure, Brian Guy, if the volume was... Well, I was posting in the room, in the futures room there, at about 
three times. I want to do one more time there. I haven't looked at the end of the day to see how much of the volume has increased over to the June contract. Mm -hmm. um, not sure why I decided. I decided to switch over to the June contract because I just wanted to trade it along with what Ben's calling out as far as price. And he's already switched, right? Um, the big thing is I think people are going to switch tomorrow. Um, I don't usually switch even this earlier because I really think that... Uh, you know, if the actual contract rollover is on the 15th, which is next Friday, I like to usually do it by the Tuesday or the Wednesday of the week that it's closing on the Friday. Yeah. Uh, hang on. But, you know, I was posted a few times there today. I still got it open here. I'm just going to see when we refresh it. What the volume change between the two is. I had about 50%. It looks like it's still about 50%. I've got the two. Oh no, it's screwed because it's night. So it's showing right now June twenty five ninety and March forty seven eleven. So it's doing it on the nighttime volume now. Okay. Oh yeah, we're six thirty five. We're open, but yeah, it's still about the same, about fifty percent. So you know, I kind of understood that there's going to be a lot of people, the big guys flipping over today. Yeah. But I always try to base it, and this is kind of a question in the futures room, so I want to try to answer it nice and cool. Hopefully they're all listening right now on how you do it. The uh, rollover date is not actually until next Friday. You talk about rollover in futures. Uh, typically, you look at the Ben he's talking about, and the traders in the pit will get on to the new contract quicker, but you don't necessarily have to move today. You've got up to next Friday. So you got to watch your software. Take TOS, for example, okay? It didn't happen until later today, right, Bright Guy? At 6. Yeah. So if I wanted to see the June contract this morning and I put up slash ES in my TOS, you know what I was looking at? March. Mm-hmm. So if you want to look at June, I actually had to put in the slash ESM3. And then you can see it. It'll bring it up. Yeah. So. I'm trying to run a comparison for you guys at home. I have on the screen, actually, the split between. I have uh, March on the left and June on the right. This is a one-hour chart. Okay. So you can see there's a spread there. Let me see. Let me bring it up. And you could look at the volume at the bottom and see how you had very little volume in the last, uh, the, the earlier part of the week in the June contract uh, and today it looks like you have a lot more volume going on versus the March contract. Okay, now let me just point this out. You see you got, you got 1545.50 for a high. Can't see last, okay, 1542.1537 June. So you got a five point spread still. Five point was the spread earlier today and you still got a five point spread now running, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I think it was Larry 55 I don't know if he's still in the room asking, saying that, you know, am I going to be an advantage here in holding my position here going on? So I explained to him that, you know, if you want to hold it for a rollover, you can get a beneficial drop, you know, like five points automatically if you're holding a short on it. But I said, if it moves up before you go, then you're screwed. If, it, if you hold it to that Friday, they move you automatically, and you're in there, and you're in a short at 40, and it's, you're at 45, then you're down five mm -hmm. right away. So, if you're going to play it, you got to keep an eye on it. And uh, this is going to be in effect all the way up till next Friday is the actual cutoff date. Not this Friday, next Friday. Right. Let's see, uh, it's not the 28th? No, I got my calendar here. I had it open earlier today. It's the uh, I know the Friday 13th of March. Sorry, 15th. 15th. March 15th. Yep. Bunch of contracts part of it. Okay. I'm trying to... Let me get my calendar. I don't even have it turned here. Well, maybe the, I was hearing them say the 18th is when it starts to trade, which would be Sunday, I guess. Well, the full official when it will trade will be the first business day after the close of the rollover on the 15th will be the 18th on the Monday. Okay. All right? But everybody should be trading it probably going into the weekend. But the new traders coming in on the 18th will be definitely on the new one.
So if any of you guys out there have any questions for Vester, this is your opportunity to get them answered as he's here live and in person. Apple sales for the current fiscal quarter may fail to meet the iPhone and iPad maker's own forecast, as well as Wall Street's projections, according to Glenn Yung, a Citigroup analyst. The chart of the day displays the average second quarter sales estimate since November 1st, a month after into the company's fiscal year. Citigroup cut its revenue figure yesterday by 3.7 percent. Demand is falling for components used in the iPhone 5 and the full-size iPad judging by contacts with suppliers interesting and yet we had uh, Corningware was up today wasn't it or was at least starting to move a little bit he says to himself yeah exactly because I'm not looking at stocks <laughs> no idea. <laughs> All right, no problem. I was, I'm just reflecting something. I, I can look about. at a stock and a chart and give you my analysis on it, but I don't watch them. Gotcha. Why should you? Exactly. So I was trying to actually find the announcement about the um, futures contracts, and my platform is just... I'm not used to looking at news on TD Ameritrade's site here. Yeah, me neither. I try to look at some features on it, and it's like, still flashing here. Like every day, flashes. Uh, oh, right now, live. Oh, I can't even read it. My 24 inch monitor doesn't bring up their fonts very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. That's all right. Anyway. Let's see. Oversold lean hog futures explode higher. Oversold lean hog. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Let me see what's going on with this. Hang on. Do I use tick Hello? charts, cheap stocks? Let me tell you. I was, yes. Uh, McMill. How you doing? Thank you for picking up. McMill. Yes, well, you know, I don't have the fancy system that uh, some of the other guys have here. Hold on, Chief Stocks, I'll answer. So I'm just going to... Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, All right, uh, go ahead. I can hear you. You can hear him. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm holding the phone up to my microphone. I feel like I'm going to have to teach you how to talk on the radio. You got to turn I think down. So. Your, I'm, not, I'm not getting that. Buddy. Come on. Turn down the website. <laughs> go ahead. T ask him the question. When I'm running a long and a short at the same time? Maybe you can clear that up, Vester. What, what were you I'm not discussing? sure what he's saying there, but he's saying I'm running a long and I'm running a short at the same time? That's the impression he got, but obviously you can't do both. So no, on one platform, you cannot run a long and a short at the same time. If I had, you gotta t you got to turn the website off. Yeah, here's the thing, um, unfortunately, because of the way you called in, McMill, is you, I, Vester can hear you, but you won't be able to hear him unless you have your internet on. So I do realize oh, there's okay. a little odd right. thing going on. Yeah, you can, but only through the, the speaker. So there's a delay when he answers. Okay, let me just try to answer him directly so here. Let, hold on a second, McMill. Investor will give you an answer. There you go. All right. Okay, here we go. I'm going to answer you. I don't know where you got the impression that I was doing a long and a short at the same time. 
and I have no idea on how any way you can possibly do it with one broker. Now, if I had an account with Mirrors Futures and I had an account with TradeStation set up directly with them, I could run a hedge. I could run short one over there and long two over here. I don't know any way you could possibly do it with one broker. You need two. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's legal. Well, it's perfectly legal. You can do it, obviously, but you'd have to have two separate brokers. You can't do it with one. Yeah, I that just, I know of. Maybe I, there's a broker out there that will do it for you, but I don't well, think. I think that would be illegal. But I don't think you know if you use two separate ones, you can do it. Well, you could do it with one broker. You just need separate accounts. You would need one, one account yeah, you can have two accounts with one broker. Yes, short. you can do it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll leave that to you guys to tell me that because um, I know when you do open an account. It, um, they ask you if you have a futures account at another broker. That's right. And they uh, do. I don't know why they want to know that, other than the fact that there might be something against doing that. Well, I don't see there's anything unjust about doing that. Basically, all you're doing is you're hedging your own trade, right? It's not a big deal. Okay. So I don't think that there's going to be any issues that way. It's just you can't do it on one account. You'd have to have two accounts. You could open two accounts with them. You could do the hedge on the one account and do your position on the other one. But you have to have two separate accounts to do it. But you can't do it on one. So right. mine is 791111, my account. And if I long two on that, I can't put a short order on 791111 on that account at the same time, right? Because it's going to stop me out. Yeah. So to get back to what we were talking about earlier, Vester was really only referring to his stops. So so he puts on an order at one level, and then he was setting his stop orders at these other uh, at his at, he right. Yes, well, he, he um, uh, I mean he can. Vester doesn't have loss. What I do is I take and I set my stop, and then I start pushing my stop up. Am I talking to McMill here? You are talking to McMill, but he's going to hear you on a delay. So Okay, so I'm McMill, what out. I do is I set my sell order in, say, at 39.50 right now, okay? So if I'm long on this, I'll set a stop at 36, okay? We're currently trading 37 even. So if it moves up 37, 50, 38, then I start pushing my stop up. So I keep closing my little bracket there, and I'm hoping it's going to hit my target. But if, at worst case scenario, where I'm happy to be is once I get it above my entry, I try to at least get it up at least a point or more, depending on how much the price is going to move on this, on a move like that. But, I mean, if it's going to be like a tight little sky scalp, well, then I'll just take and put a buy in there and I'll put a sell in there if it's a point above and i got that price range in the DOM going on there. And if I see that it should be moving up, then I'll say I'll just put a buy in there and I'll put a sell order in where the last price is on the DOM right now, which is 58.25. And if I see it's not going to go, then I start pulling it down and get out. But it's not really my way of trading it. But, you know, if you want to scalp, I do it that way. All right. All right. So, um... Yeah, McMill. If you have uh, Skype on on your phone or something, you can you can call in to Skype, and the investor can hear you fine, and we can have this conversation a little easier. But otherwise, we're dealing with this delay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me. Set, I'll, I'll, I'll work that. I'll do that for next time. Okay. But all I, all I I saw your number, and I just I grabbed the house phone because. In order to Skype, I wouldn't be able to catch the show. I'd have to eliminate that from the, um, um, you know, from the screen on the uh, on the telephone. Okay, no problem, yeah. no problem. We'll try that All next right. time. Okay, and, yeah, cool. I'll call, I'll call back again at a, a different show. Well, thanks for calling in now, McMill. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, McMill. Have a good day, buddy. Thanks for picking up, Brian. You got it. Thanks for being persistent. Okay. <laughs> All right. I uh, I finally picked up the phone and we realized we got. A member calling into the show, which is great. Um, of course, I've got that number set to my regular cell phone and not to my Skype account, so I don't have uh, that cool feature that Johnny does, where he could just kind of rewire anything into anything and, and have those conversations. Oh yeah, he's got a cool uh, van too. You just press a button and it closes the door in the box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does, does he have one of those foot things that come All out? Right. And <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, awesome time. Uh, spent a night in uh, Nyack, and uh, that's right. You were you stayed the at best the hotel western up there. there. Right? You've probably been there, eh, Bry? Eh? I have not. No, you were in Hooker, Hooker's Corner. <laughs> that's what our PM <laughs> said to me. Are you are you down by Hooker's Corner in there? I had to go. Damn, no, I'm not. Where is it? <laughs> Oh my goodness! I no, guess he gets not. Around. But anyway, uh, they picked us up, and uh, yeah, we went out and had a nice tour all around Nyack. Johnny gave us a nice tour and everything. It was awesome. Very and, good. Uh, we went to a nice. Uh, well, what would they say yesterday? It was a uh, steak. I wanted uh, steak or uh, pasta, so we picked a nice restaurant and uh, had an awesome meal. And then we turned around a few of the little local establishments in Nyack, and then went back to the office. Got to see the office and uh, see some. Uh, memorabilia in there and uh it was awesome and uh, then they took us home it was an uh, awesome night in Nyack and then uh, the next three in New York awesome time there too we were at the uh uh I can't even remember now I the Marriott oh yeah you mean the next yeah we were at the Marriott or? right in the Times Square there oh, expensive yeah. expensive <laughs> oh yeah 80 bucks a day for the car and uh 78 bucks for a lunch, 10 bucks for a beer. <laughs> welcome to New York. Oh, welcome to New York. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, hey, it was a good time, and uh, I took uh, Abby to a Broadway show there. How'd that go? Chicago. That was awesome. We were three rows from the stage. Wow. And I had an aisle seat. Awesome. Could wow. Put my feet out. Yeah, yeah. So when the guy came around and said, if you want wine, yeah, give me one. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Wine. Don't ask me twice. Yeah, don't ask me twice. Well, I didn't get a second one, just one. Just one. If I got to endure this, I can have one. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there for me. You know what I'm saying? Not a Chicago but I tell you, these girls come out in their little skitties. It was uh, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the show Chicago, but you know what I mean, if you saw it. <laughs> I think we can imagine. My wife wants to go see Cirque du Soleil. Oh, yeah, Cirque du Soleil. That's a good one. Yeah. The, uh, the next one's starting up in another another uh, month and they're going to be at City Field this year which I'm not exactly sure if that's in the stadium or out in the parking lot that they're going to do that but my guess is out in the parking lot they have a 2600 seat tent well I would suggest you do it because it's a really good show yeah we've been the last uh, few years I think we've been to about six or seven shows so this is the new one and uh, we were looking at seats uh, available available seats and trying to figure out a day to go and we'll work that out. It's not too bad. It's a nice little night out. Nice, very nice. Yeah, it was a nice little night out for us too in Chicago. Three hundred eighty nine bucks or three hundred oh three twenty nine sorry for the for the seats. Mm -hmm. I think it was like twelve dollars for the little bit of wine I got. All right. But got a nice memorabilia cup that the wine was served in. So ah, very good. Awesome. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, let me tell you, it was a great time in New York, and uh, you know, I went down to Florida first, right? And uh, I was cleaning out some furniture in my condo because I'm renting it out, and they wanted it empty, so I'm trucking back from Florida up to New York. It's Nyack, and so I get the girlfriend drive in New York, and uh, she can't find a hotel in Nyack, so we end up going over the pay toll bridge like three times. <laughs> And I said to her, you know what, this is all fun and games, but, you know, i got to pee. So we got to get to that goddamn hotel. <laughs> now. <laughs> Funny, anyway. But uh, So anyway, we finally got to it. And that's the most upset I got with her on the whole trip for two weeks that I was with her. So it was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very high tolerance level, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we, we finally got in there, and uh, then we headed to the Marquis Marriott downtown, and then uh, we were able to walk to the Ambassador Hotel there for the the Chicago show and everything, and uh, uh, we walked around a bunch of stores right down there and shopped, and that uh, was cool. And then uh, Hippie, met Hippie, we drove down uh, to Port Charlotte when we were down in Florida, met Hippie and his wife, Marie, which is Craig Marie, and they took us out in the boat, and we had an awful, awesome time. We stopped out on a little sandbar. We're standing in like a foot of water, and there's like nothing around us but water, and it's awesome. We're walking around all this, and then we went to a marina for lunch, and then we drove the boat back to their place for dinner, and then I went back to the condo that night. And anyways, we he flew up to New York, and we drove up to New York. Then we met him in New York, and then of course he was at the meet and greet. But then we went out and had a 
lunch at the restaurant the next day, and then we just walked all the way around. Well, actually, we cabbed it, and then went down around uh, Chinatown and all that stuff. We got some pictures on uh, Facebook, not all of them yet. And then we did the ride over Staten Island, and then back. And then that's where I got the picture of me at the bull in front of the New York St- or the American Stock Exchange. Yeah, I got the bull right by the balls. That's where I that. S- I saw came. that one. Yeah, there's actually another picture where me and Abby are at the horns. But anyway, why, why don't we see those pictures? Well, I'm gonna just share them on <laughs> Facebook. I'm just getting them uploaded now. I had to get the stick from Abby, so. Just trying to get to your page here. No, you're not putting that up, are you? Why not? <laughs> it's Facebook. Good night, Mary. Well, I guess it's not public. I won't oh, put those, them up if you don't those want Those pictures it. should be. I made them public. Oh, okay. No, that well, was the nightclub. They're public. You should be able to put them up. Well, then shut up. I'm going to put it up there. <laughs> All right. I'm going to shut up. Hey, I'm going to be taking like a two-minute break here. I'll be right back. So you do that, and I'll be, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. I'll be right back in two minutes. Don't All hang right. up. You got it, man. So there's there's a great shot of uh, Vester here in New York City. And if you haven't been to New York City, this is a sculpture uh, near Wall Street. Uh, it's a pretty large sculpture. You probably see it in a lot of commercials and advertisements and such. So pretty funny stuff. I was uh, looking up the information on the rollover inf- uh, contracts and reading some information here on... Investopedia. Uh, contract rollover occurs on the Thursday, a week before the expiration Friday. For the E-minis, this is the second Thursday of March, June, September, and December. If the rollover month starts on a Friday, the rollover is the first Thursday of the same month. The next contract becomes the lead contract or the front month. Even though the previous contract continues to trade until expiration, the majority of trading moves to the next contract. For example, if the TFU-12 contract expires on September 21st, the rollover date would be the previous Thursday, or September 13 in this case. The majority of trading would switch to the December contract, TFZ-12, as of market open 9.30 Eastern on the rollover date. Figure 5 illustrates the increase in volume, and we talked about that. Um, Many active traders will trade the old contract on rollover day and then switch to the new contract on the next day, or make the switch on the actual rollover day. Figure 5 shows that after rollover, the volume of the current contract wanes while the volume of the upcoming contract increases. In general, traders should move into the new contract as volume moves from one to the other. Some traders avoid rollover day altogether because it's considered by many to be choppy and challenging to trade. It's important to do your own homework and research to determine if your trading strategy is affected by rollover trading. And we heard uh, Vester actually make that comment earlier in saying that perhaps he's going to avoid trading the rollover day in the future. Uh, But here you can see the volume. Let me just change the color of the volume bar on my uh, platform here. And you can see where the volume has uh, been clicking up to the 40,000 mark versus uh, back here on March, it was clicking up to the uh, 200 mark on this hourly chart. If I go to a daily, it might be even more obvious. Let me change this uh, both sides to daily. So here you see on the March contract some pretty steady volume getting up into the, uh, let me see where my volume info is, and okay, 2 million, that's the 2 over here, is for 2 million, versus on today's volume we hit 871,000, or I should say yesterday's session, okay, so on we hit 1.6 million on the March contract versus 871,000 on the June. So from that standpoint, it was lower volume um, than the March. But when you look at the hourly, 
you can see the uh, rotation of the volume through the day is slightly different on the June. But anyway, you got to switch over at some point, and it's up to you with your trading style to decide how you do that. Uh, according to the CME Group website, for 2013, the March contract rolls over on March 7, expires on March 15th, which is what Vester was saying next Friday. The June contract will roll over on the 13th of June, expiring on the 21st of June. So there's, uh, let's see if I still have that link in the room or the chat room open. I can give you those those numbers. And by the way, we see uh, Dr. Gas checking in with us. Good to see you there. And making some comments about the current evening volume for March 6,720 versus June 3,981. So still quite a bit of volume on the March contract versus June, comparatively speaking. And it's up to you how you want to trade that. Gas says he trades the new contract once volume exceeds the old contract. So based upon that, it sounds like he's still looking to trade the March contract. You guys uh, may also know that next week is the tax deadline for corporations, March 15th. So if you are a trader with a corporation that you're trading with, keep that in mind. You want to get your taxes filed by March 15th. If not, then you want to at least get your estimated taxes put together and file your, uh, your extension, your six-month extension by next next week. If you're looking for a, an accountant, if you're looking for a day trading accountant in particular, then you might be interested to check out some of the videos we have in the members forum. For example, there's a tools of the trade episode that we did actually the first episode of 2013. Now, where did my chat room go? Here it is and I'll put that link in the room there for you guys so you can go check out that video and um, you can get access to also the um, accountants information which happens to be married to our fearless leader Courtney so check out her information there she's got her website her blog her phone number you want to reach out to her uh, I don't know if she gave me her email address, but it might be on her website. And if you want to listen back over the video, you can listen to um, what it was like when the ES was trading at 1454. <laughs> it seems not so long ago uh, because it wasn't so long ago. So it's 7 o'clock here, and in general, I have the show wrapped up by now but we did have this uh, special guest calling in Vester and he's asked me to wait for him while he runs out for a smoke uh, I know he didn't say that's what he was doing but I know Vester long enough to realize that's probably what he's doing and I don't know if he's got the sound on but so be it so I'll tell you what let me just put on another tune or two hold on I'm back oh he's back I just want to touch on a little subject I kind of mentioned briefly there about sure. moving average lines. Sure. Um, if you're using moving average lines and you find they're not working for you, you need to change them. So I'm running the 9 and 18 still on one computer, but I switched to the 8 and 3 on other ones. And I'll tell you, this is important because algorithms change. And if you find that your moving averages aren't working for you, you need to change them. I'm glad you said that because when you were talking about the different, I think you said three and and six or three and eight. And three and eight. Three and eight. And, eight, and, yeah. and nine and eighteen. Nine and eighteen. Yeah. So I was I was thinking that same exact thing you just said, which is that we have folks that listen, and I I see this all the time, and and I did this when I was just starting out. This guy's given me these 
tra these averages. Another guy's giving me different averages. Next thing I do, I've got my screen with all 12 different moving averages on one chart. And you end up with analysis paralysis. Yeah. So I use four only. Yeah. I use the 9, 18, or the 3 and 8, and I keep the 50 and the 120 on. Okay. And the biggest thing I have support lines on. So I have a support line up where the price is now, and it looks like it's going to go down, and maybe it's going to gap fill. And I look for that gap fills on charts as well. So, I mean, if we're rolling around on this line and we're not going up, it's probably going to go down, and we're going to hit that previous low. So if you're trading it, we're in some sideways consolidation on the U.S. right now. It's probably going to, you know, what I look at is when it moves down and hits sideways consolidation, it continues on the trend down after that sideways consolidation. If it's moving up, that's where you get the flags. You get that sideways consolidation there when it's moving up, and then it usually moves up after that. But the same thing works when it's going down. So that's not talking moving averages, but the fact is right now I'm looking at the price, and it's pretty much hung right now between moving averages and my trend line I have, and I expect it's going to break that trend line because I kind of drew it off that last candle at uh, I don't know, it was about 10 minutes ago. And it's probably going to lose that, and it's probably going to come down. Um, and we get a gap fill to the bottom where the previous low was. It's probably a good possibility you could take a long at that point and go up. I'm trying to just send a message back to my wife, so you feel free to offer any more commentary if you'd like. Well, if there's any questions in the room that I uh, haven't answered, if you've got a question, I'm happy to answer it. Longer time frames, Tommy's saying yes. I always keep an eye on that 15 minute and a 30 minute. Because, you know, if you want to get an idea which way the trend's going, and you're on a 5 minute or a 2 minute, God have it for maybe going in a 1 minute anymore, but. You know, a two-minute or a three-minute, two-minute. I heard actually pros mention they watched a two-minute in uh, New York, which is kind of cool because that's kind of what I watch. But uh, I always keep the 15 to 30 in the other two computers, and I can switch to a daily or a 60-minute at any time in one of those and have a look. Um, now, the biggest thing is when you get into these days where it's choppy like this, it's... Pretty tough to trade. Uh, pretty much today, you could put like a sideways channel in and try to short it at the top line, and you know, buy it, buy it at the the bottom line, and then go long. So you can uh, sell two, buy four, and sell two, buy four, or whatever. So once you sell two, you buy four. You're doing four and four back and forth. But you know, how long does that channel last? Is the question, right? You don't know when it's going to break out of that channel. So you have to have those lines in there so you know when it actually breaks that channel, either up or down, when it goes. Um, I'm pretty much sure right now this is probably going to break this support line I got here, and it's probably going to go back down to that uh, 3550 level. Based on what I'm seeing where my stochastic are right now with the bond coming in there, it just broke it right there. What time frame is this? Five? Uh, I'm on a five minute right now, yeah. Just going to change the ones on the screen so we can. Tomahawk, I'm disappointed. A uh, girlfriend made an executive decision in there and said that it would take two hours to cook the roast right now, so she's cooking chicken. So, got to wait. <laughs> so, right now, what I see on my five minute, the price action just broke my trend line that I had there. I'm at. Previous candle at uh, 1840. That's where my support line was running up from the low at 1415. So I'm thinking that this price action is going to move down here to the low at 1415, which puts us at uh, 1535.75, probably where it's going right now. See that, Brian? 
Where's that? You get your chart up. You see that? Oh, I don't know if you had a support line under there or not. I don't know. What do you got? There's uh, you have both ES contracts up there? I have both ES on the screen. Okay, see how that candle just broke down through that? Oh, I see what you're sideways saying. Sideways consolidation there? See yeah. what I talked about? How it comes down, sideways consolidation, and continues on that trend that it's going. Right. Same thing when you're moving up. You get that sideways consolidation. Often we refer to as a flag. And then you break higher off of that. Well, you get the same thing when you're going down. You come down here and you get this buy pressure coming up and you see how it keeps failing and failing and failing and failing and then eventually it drops. So what you're going to watch for is that previous low area is a target. So if you want to set an easy uh, short up there, you'd be short all the way down into this. You would not even think about getting out of your short through the sideways consolidation and you'd hold it, wait for it to break down to the point. But that's the key is you want to watch and make sure that sideways consolidation start not breaking higher. See how those candles don't go any higher there? They're just mm -hmm. staying, they're hitting a level, they're dropping, hitting a level, they're dropping, hitting a level. But you're on a five minute there, so they all green, doji, green, doji, green, doji, doji, and drop. And see how it's going down there now? Yep. That's kind of key textbook that I've noted over the years, and that's the way it works. Same thing we're going up, we come down, same thing, sideways consolidation. You're holding the short, hold the short, go through that sideways, and then you'll get that down move after. And uh, it, it's pretty key when you're, especially today in today's markets, when it's uh, tight range, really tight. I mean, you got to take whatever you can in an advantage to try to get some tech movement, right? So, now you see this coming back up. On a five minute candle and suck right back. I think if you watch this, your stochastic is still going negative on that chart. I'm seeing here on your screen, ESM3. See, so it keeps going up and sucking back. Uh, some uh, players think this is the bottom here, but the bottom here is probably not going to be the bottom until we actually get down to that trend line you have there, right? Is, um, do you look at time and sales at all? I run the time in sales, and uh, thanks to Dr. Gas, I switched it on TOS to a greater than 10. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what the 1s and the 2s and the 4s are doing. I want to see what the bigger players are doing. Okay. So if I see all red on the big players are selling it, then I know that they're uh, they're going to sell into anything pushing up here and going to go down. Well, let's see if we can do that without blowing up the uh, chart too much. Move that over. So there we see. Looks like some sales going through. 44, 11, 10, 10. Now you're on greater than 10? Yep. Yep, okay. See, it's all red? Mm hmm. No, switch that right now live to like uh, all times and, and show that. You'll see some buyers coming in, you see sellers coming in. So just click on that 10 and switch to all size. Yep. Done. Okay, now see that? See all the green in there? See all the ones and twos and everything in there? But you know the big guys are selling it. So anytime these things, these guys are pushing it up, they're selling right into that push. Now, that's how I use time and sales, okay? You asked me the question, so that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to see now is going back to my price action of my candles here. You see how that's green? It's kind of equal to the previous down candle, but it keeps sucking back down, right? See? So every time the, the little guys come in there and try to push it up, the big guys come in there, sell into that, push it down. So now what I want to see here is this does not go higher than this candle. And eventually, how many times is this going to happen? This comes up and back down, up, up, back down. It's going to fail, and it's going to come down probably to that trend line. And then I would watch, really, at that level, if it's a good support area, if it's a previous low, that maybe we could have a good bounce. And I'm a firm believer on the one, two, threes. So, bright guy, what I'm telling you is if we come down to this level once, we come down to it again, we probably bounce off it, right? Mm -hmm. But if we bounce off it and we come down again on a third time, we're probably going to break that level if we're going to go lower. Right. Rarely have a triple bounce. Rarely, yeah. Same thing on a top. If you get a double top and the third time it doesn't go through, then odds are you're going to be wanting to short it because 
you know, on that third attempt and it didn't make it, that's a price failure at that point and you're going to want to sell it off. And it's kind of like today where we had that little uh, quick move up where Dockwins took the short off that high. And I said, how did you get a signal on that? She said, well, it moved up too fast. And I said, well, good call. And uh, you know what? We never did break up out of that ascending triangle pattern. It broke down. So there's another thing you can look at. When you look at patterns and you have it set up, and you got an ascending triangle which is very bullish and it fails, that's a strong signal to the bears. Right? So you know you're going to go down. And you look at what happened today with the price action when it failed to push up and sold right off and come back down into that. And look where we are now versus then. So there's a lot of things. You can't talk about it in like 25 or 30 minutes over five and a half years experience doing it but there's a lot of different things you look at but you see how this is breaking down now this is what I said every time they come in here they buy it they're still doing it retailers are buying it up here and the big guys are coming in and they're selling it off and uh, the direction on this is probably the one IQ right down to that uh, previous low at that point being only the second time it's there probably gonna bounce I would say so if you want to set a buy limit for uh, double the cars to go long on there might work after hours I don't know um, but I'm saying probably that's going to be your target right now so when I'm looking at entering a trade let's say I was short from that top line there when I know it failed to break out I'm short on that top line there and uh, I get it down here and I see the, all the candles coming down here and I don't see anything to the left anything to stop this price right now other than that previous low. It's pretty easy to set a, a buy order in at that level because really it's going to be rangeless until it finds it, right? It always has a target where it wants to go and it has to have a level that it's been at if I can be that bold. But it does. So if you kind of watch that, it, it works. So would you be writing this down with just one contract? Or would you be after hours if I was doing it? I'd probably just one one one. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been trading three during the day. Um, two if I'm not really sure. I like to run two at least. Uh, so if I'm right at least, and I can take one off and do a runner. Mm -hmm. Like Johnny said, it's pretty hard to do a runner on one contract, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it. it I try to do two. Uh, I try to do three if I'm uh, assured of you know what I'm looking at and it's going to work. Um, but if I'm not so sure, I still like to run a two as a minimum. That way, if you know it does go that way, and I want to lock some profit in. But I kind of right now with the way that it's been so choppy with the uh, contract rollover and everything, and not just that that we're near highs, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people not sure whether where we should go at this point. So we're getting a lot of chop action right now. Uh, it's not so much data. You look at the Greece crisis and you look at everything else, and like Hippie said something about something the other day, and they said, yeah, just throw that over there in a the pile with all the other bad news. You know, we're going to keep going. Um, it's it's about the price action, and, and you're watching it. And uh, these these levels that... <laughs> I don't know, I guess just have to say, it doesn't matter what you see beyond anything else, is you watch the candles on a five minute, and uh, they pretty much tell you this, the story, of which way we're going. So, if, you know, the stochastic, doesn't matter if they're going up, and the price action's holding and not moving, well, then that's the divergence. I've mentioned that a couple of times in there yesterday. So, it's moving up, but the price isn't. So, you know, when that rolls around, you know what's going to happen. That's when we get our next candle down. So, beyond moving averages and anything else, you just focus on price action and you can see how it works. You know, the big point, too, adding into the same thing is when you get a, a flag on the way down, or what I would call consolidation, how you continue on the same way that you came into it. And you can see how it's working tonight.
So anyway, I think I'm pretty much done. I don't know if anything else. Uh, anybody have any questions? It's pretty simple. My 918 did cross. My other moving average is on here, so it did indicate it was going to be a good short, and we had a gap down on that candle at uh, 6 o'clock, and it did cross those moving averages. And so, yeah, it said it was going to be a good short. And there's the short that um, we put on, or I put on. How much are you up now? Uh, Twenty-five dollars, thirty-seven fifty. Bad. Slow move, but uh, you put it at uh, thirty-five and a half. Or what's that low? Well, you know what? I forced it in there actually at thirty-seven. I could have um, probably held on for thirty-seven quarter, but I just wanted to get the trade started for the demo purposes. But right. Well, thirty-nine to fifty would have been your level to short it, right? Yeah. You're if, up, if you're out close. Yeah. Line, on uh, several multiple touches up that thirty nine fifty would be your signal that uh, you know if this isn't going up it's going to go down and so your target entry there would have been somewhere around thirty nine even and then across the lines there would have assured you that and then the gap down at six o'clock would have really made you feel good but um, yeah but uh, even that yeah, entering there still good because you're going to still get what what did you get in it thirty seven yeah thirty seven and uh, I'm thinking we're going to retag 35.75, so not bad. That's pretty good. Hmm. All right. Well, Vester, I appreciate you calling in and and uh, giving some more insight into your trading style and the and answering some of the questions that some folks have had about, I guess, uh, getting some followers there in the futures room. So that's pretty good. Appreciate it, and glad you guys are doing healthy and enjoy your dinner. Yeah. Well, we try. We try to make lots of money every day in there, and so if you're thinking about joining the Futures, come and join the Futures room, and uh, I'm trying to keep her all serious, Futures only. Yep. So everybody have a great night, and uh, thanks for having me on there. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Good night. All right. That was member Vester here on DayTradingRadio.com, Bry Guys After Hours Show, and if you are not a member, then we highly recommend that you sign up there's a link on the scrolling bar under the video that you can click on and uh, if you have any questions about the membership you can ask myself or um, you can go to the main web page and there's some help screens there that you can check out as well I'm going to wrap up the show here we thank you guys for checking in and uh, listening to the show um, I do tend to record these after hour shows and not that they're always something interesting to go back on, but nights like tonight where we get some uh, a nice guest calling in, then uh, this might be a show that will uh, be worth going back over and reviewing. Uh, probably just need a couple of days, though, to get the video set up and, um, and converted. I don't know if I'll cut out the beginning of the video and just have it with Vester's interview or, or what, but you guys uh, can look for that in the next couple of days and check that out in the members forum. In the meantime, you can go in there and find actually another time when Vester came on. If you want to see how much he's grown as a trader, then go back into the forum and you'll see, let me see if I get the link actually for you. This was back on, let me see, I was going to do a show, I remember on uh, on solo monitor trading and we ended up getting Vester calling in so I think it was episode 7 or 8 if you guys can check that out I'm trying to find oh here it is it must somebody must have commented on it and I'll put that in the room for you and we had uh, like I said Vester calling in and and uh, we did a little impromptu show going over some of his trading styles and he actually talked a lot about trading uh, with the candlesticks so check that out guys and hopefully you'll uh, be able to benefit from that and of course get into the into the futures room and one thing I will tell you guys though is don't get in the habit of simply shadowing another trader because uh, that's not how you're gonna learn instead you'll end up in a trade longer than he might be or in a trade after he's already in and I, I even saw 
I don't know if it was Vester or somebody was mentioning in the room about uh, the things that the levels that they were able to put in, and sometimes they're putting them in a little bit after the trade gets put in because they're busy. You know, we're making money; it's a business, so you can't always be watching the trade and also updating the chat room. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, do it as best you can because we try to be honest with one another and help one another out. But when there's a choice between making money or, no! or, or type it in the chat room. Um, and that sound, by the way, was my platform. I set a stop for that four ticks, and it, it took it out. And there you see that breakdown right to the 3575 mark. Um, I don't see a big bulk of trades coming through, but there's 43 contracts coming in at 36. So that probably took out the rest of the orders there sitting at 36 and dropped it to the 3575 mark. Uh, but then we only have a uh, dollar trades. But this would have been an example where if I had two contracts on, I could have taken one off here at 40 at four ticks, and just sit around waiting to see what happens next. I could have put the stop on the second one at 36 half, and uh, then we could sit here and and see if this actually happens to run through that level and keeps going. If not, then we'd be out with six ticks. If it does, we have a chance of picking up 8, 10, 12, etc. So that's just uh, another way to trade. But that's going to do it here for Bry Guys After Hour Show. Thanks, guys. Uh, tomorrow, 8.30, if I'm not mistaken, we should have RPM returning to the airwaves again for his uh, Friday show. If he doesn't come on exactly at 8.30, I think... Um, I think uh, Johnny will still be on the start at 8.30, and then they'll just switch off at some point. So you can check that out tomorrow on the show. Uh, I see Vester insisting that I should have stayed short in that trade, and that's fine. I just um, set it in there just for the fun. And actually, I still have that long going on the, uh, on the March contract, and I'm down $75 there. So there's a way to, to hedge. You can trade the two contracts and uh, hedge it that way. Anyway, let me close all this down. I'm going to shut the video down as well and um, I'll log back in, put some tunes on for you guys. You can watch the uh, rest of the trading for the evening. Here's the... Uh, let's change that to the uh, ES June contract and try to zoom that in a little bit. Oh, you know what? And and here's another thing, because I I put these um, calendar entries onto the ES chart, not the ES H3 chart, so that they continue to show throughout the week. Um, and so we had the Japanese domestic um, gross domestic report coming through here at the 1850 mark. Didn't seem to affect our markets very much, but. Uh, We'll see how that goes for the rest of the night. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Appreciate the support. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to send me an email, text message, uh, hit me up on Skype, and we'll do our best to help you out. Um, I did have somebody reach out to me on Twitter today, and uh, I believe he, he or she mentioned that they were going to be listening to the show. So I hope they enjoyed the show. I don't know if they're still around. But I just wanted to give you a heads up and let you know that we ran the show a little bit longer than usual. So I'm not going to be available on uh, Skype for a little bit of a while as i got to take care of a couple of things. But if I'm on later on, you can certainly hit me up and I'll do my best to answer your questions. If not, we'll see if we can get together tomorrow sometime. Okay? So, again, thanks for listening to Bry Guys After Hours Show here on DayTradingRadio.com. It's what you turn on when the markets turn off. Good night, everyone.